In his first inaugural address in 2009, President Barack Obama laid out an ambitious and sweeping agenda for the nation that very prominently and somewhat pointedly included a promise to restore science to its rightful place. In many ways, the fact that the president chose John Holdren for nothing less than that task uh, tells you everything you need to know about his uh, illustrious scientific and social contributions as a scientist. Um, he was named assistant to the president for science and technology uh, and director of the Office of Science and Technology Policy. Um, as I said, he's made extensive contributions to knowledge and society, which a few brief moments of introduction could not do justice, and I, I will not try. Uh, but let me relate here just a few observations from time shared in the White House that speak a bit to the relationship of John's accomplishments to leadership, to social science and policy. Um, first and foremost, uh, John was among the very highest level advocates in the administration, not just for good science and technology policy specifically, but also for the broader project, inclusive of both the natural and social sciences, of making policy based on good data and sound science. Uh, I actually came, first came into John's orbit in this context, uh, working as an economist, uh, building what came to be called the Social and Behavioral Sciences Team, uh, which was a group that worked to translate insights from behavioral economics and psychology to federal policy applications. Um, as its name indicates, this was a thoroughly social scientific endeavor, uh, but it came to be led by staff at OSTP under John's leadership uh, and organized under the National Science and Technolo Technology Council of which John was the chair. Uh, more broadly, uh, behind the scenes, and I, I don't think everyone appreciates or knows the full extent of this, uh, many of the advances in evidence-based policymaking in the Obama administration, which we as social scientists hold very dear, um, making more extensive use of administrative data, building research capacity at agencies, uh, more widely employing randomized evaluation methods for designing and evaluating social policy, among others, uh, were either supported substantially or led outright by the Office of Science and Technology Policy uh, and championed at the highest levels by John. Uh, John also exhibited uh, a rare and essential dedication to the practice, to the craft, of public service in a way that transcends the natural or social science distinction. Um, at OSTP, John was not only a scientist and a policymaker, uh, but also a leader and a manager, reinvigorating old institutions like the President's Council of Advisors on Science and, Te and Technology, uh, as well as helping to create new ones. Uh, he, John was an effective communicator to both policymakers and the public. Um, in preparing reports that would go out with John's signature or approval, uh, we were given a seven-page single-space style guide written by John himself, uh, detailing his personal do's and don'ts of effective writing. Um, probably the most extended and contentious interactions John and I had in government were over the proper use of hyphens in our NSTC reports. <laughs> but uh, John was, of course, right, and not just about the hyphens, you were right about those too. Um, but about the attention to that level of detail, to the clarity of communication. Um, and I still sort of have that and keep that with me and I think speaks to the sense in which John was also a mentor and a role model, um, guiding and inspiring future generations of public servants in science and social science uh, policy. Um, Dr. Holdren would go on to serve all eight years, making him the longest serving science advisor to a president in the history of that position. And I think fulfilling that somewhat daunting charge of restoring science to its rightful place. In the waning days of the administration, a common exercise across offices uh, was to do some reflection on the top few or handful of accomplishments over the previous eight years. Uh, OSTP put together a list of 100, uh, from the Climate Action Plan to the Precision Medicine Initiative, from efforts to make data more open uh, to protecting the scientific integrity of agency research, all under John's leadership. John truly embodies the mission of the academy and the ideals of the prize, that we might use science not just to better understand the world, but to make the world better. Dr. Holdren, it is my honor and pleasure on behalf of the academy to introduce you tonight as the winner of the 2018 Daniel Patrick Moynihan Prize.
Let's, let's do this. It's the middle facing all, the right all way. All three of us. Okay. Up the middle. Yep. All right, guys. Ready? Okay, here we go. One, two, three. One. There you go. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much, William. Thank you, Ken. Um, this is a very tough set of acts to follow tonight. And it's even tougher that I'm not now just standing between you and your drinks. That not at all. I'm standing between you and your beds. Uh, <clears throat> but um, it's an enormous honor uh, to receive the Daniel Patrick Moynihan Prize uh, from this academy. And, uh, in an even bigger honor, in a way, to be the first not credentialed social scientist uh, to receive uh, this prize. Uh, as those of you who attended my lecture this afternoon know, it was my aspiration since high school to fashion a career at the intersection of natural sciences and social sciences, uh, applying the insights from both those domains to the great problems of the human condition, overpopulation, poverty, pollution, unsustainable energy supply, international conflict. Uh, I must say I never expected anyone to give me a prize for trying to work at that intersection. So that only multiplies uh, the honor. Uh, it became apparent to me in the 1960s that global climate change would become a central part of the sustainability problematique and that like the other parts that I've mentioned, it would require insights and understandings from both the natural sciences and the social sciences to either understand the problem and even more importantly, to master it. Uh, and it was really my great good fortune that with the help of an amazing set of mentors and the support of my amazing wife, Dr. Cheryl Holdren, a biologist who during the course of the Obama administration, I always called the science advisors, science advisors. Sherry, would you stand up? Uh, it was really through these mentors and this wife that I was able to uh, actually make a career of teaching research and policy advising uh, at the intersection of the natural and social sciences, uh, culminating uh, with my service to President Obama as his science advisor and the director of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy uh, for both of his terms. It really has been a wonderful ride. That was an extraordinary experience. I talked a lot about it in my lecture this afternoon, and I won't repeat that. What I do want to do in closing these brief remarks uh, is to address a question that I'm often asked in interviews Namely, whether being as active as I have been in policy advising and speaking out publicly on issues where science and public policy intersect is unduly politicizing science. If this isn't a bad idea for a scientist to engage visibly and publicly in this domain. And this is a question that came up again with particular force when the March for Science was being organized not long after the inauguration in 2017, and people said, well, scientists shouldn't really do this uh, because if they do, they'll be politicizing science. They'll look like they're in it for the money. Um, it will be bad uh, for science. And my response was and remains that that position of opposition to scientists engaging vocally in public policy uh, is a mistake. And it's a mistake, uh, it's a mistake, it's a mistake for a number of reasons. One is that science is already politicized. Decisions about how much money will be spent in federal research and development and how it will be spent are made in a highly politicized process in which all kinds of voices are heard, all kinds of opinions are expressed, the opinions of members of Congress, of departments and agencies across the federal government, of industry, of lobbyists. If the only voices that are excluded from that discussion are the voices of scientists, who in a sense know more than anybody about the stakes that are 
at issue in these discussions. If those are the only voices that are silenced because scientists are afraid to participate in public debate about these great issues of our time, then that debate will be impoverished in a very debilitating way. And of course, the notion that scientists will look like they're in it for the money is ridiculous on its face. I always ask, so let's compare the average salary of scientists in the United States with the average salary of lobbyists, with the average salaries of CEOs of the major corporations whose voices are heard. You know, we're not in it for the money. Uh, scientists are in it because they do have a special interest. They are an interest group. They are interested in the advancement of knowledge and its application to the improvement of the human condition. And that is not an interest to be ashamed of, not an interest to be embarrassed by. It's an interest to be proud of. We shouldn't be afraid that someone is going to call us an interest group. We should just continue to explain to the public and to the policymakers what that interest is. Uh, and I would very much like to think that Daniel Patrick Moynihan very strongly agreed with that proposition. Thank you very much.